Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. And Our Lady of the Rosary, pray for us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And friends, I feel like we should pray tomorrow morning pretty early. So we're going to pray at like 7.30 Eastern, so like 6.30 a.m. Central, because Stella and I are going to go meet with uh, with Father Randy, a, a priest friend of ours. Um, so we're going to be doing that. I'd rather, And I think I'd rather pray before we go do that and then hit the road. So I know that's going to be early, especially for my West Coast peeps, because you guys will be, it'll be like 4.30 in the morning. Just hit the replay, but that's going to be our game plan. So 7.30 a.m. Eastern, 6.30 a.m. Central, we'll pray the Joyful Mysteries. And don't forget, in the, in the description of this video is the link to go on the live stream to the rest of this event here at the Awakened Theater. My good buddy, Mr. Nick, come over here, Nick, so the Rosary Crew can see you real quick. Nick, thanks for having us today. It's my pleasure, Mr. Keith. Awesome. So make sure you guys head over there. And Rosary Crew, thanks again for all your support and love on our trip. It's been absolutely amazing. We just got to get home. If you want to help us, there's a link in the description where you can donate to get us home. Uh, I think we'll make it, but it'd be awesome to know for sure. So thank you guys so much. God bless all of you, my friends. And I will see you guys bright and early tomorrow morning. Take care and God bless. All right, so we just cleared that. So those of you that don't know, real quick, let me just tell you what we were just doing. And then we're going to go into some worship tonight. So how many of you don't have a clue what the Rosary Crew is? You don't have to, you know, okay. So the Rosary Crew is our online prayer group that was started in March of 2020, March 18th of 2020, to be exact. And it came about because... Of course, everyone knows what was happening during March of 2020. The pandemic started. And on the 17th of March, I went onto my YouTube channel. I just did a live stream and, and just, just to check in on people and to see, hey, how's everybody doing? Like the world's coming to an end, you know. And someone on this, on this channel suggested, Keith, can we pray the rosary live on your YouTube channel tomorrow? I had never led a rosary before that in my life. I'd only been a Catholic for... Um, just a couple of years, and I had I had never led the rosary before, and, and I, I was a little bit intimidated by it, to be honest with you. I didn't want to make a mistake and mess it up, but I thought to myself, well, these people are asking. We're in some difficult circumstances. We might as well do it. So the next day, we went on on YouTube and prayed the rosary live, and I'm sure I made all kinds of mistakes and, and butchered it terribly, but the people were so uh, gracious, and they were excited to pray, and someone said, can we do this again tomorrow? And I said, sure, why not? What else am I going to be doing? So the next day we prayed again. And they said, hey, can we just keep doing this? And I thought to myself, well, you know what? Okay, I'm, I'm going to step up here for the Lord Jesus and take one for the team. And I'm going to pray the rosary on the live stream until this pandemic is over. Two weeks. You all remember <laughs> that, right? And I was like, yep, okay, I'll do it, Lord. You, you can count on me for these two weeks. We got this. Two weeks to slow the spread. Well, <laughs> we just celebrated our four-year anniversary last month. Every single day. And now the Rosary Crew, as we call it, is a worldwide prayer community. There's, you know, 50, 60 people in this room right now. There's probably going to be about five or 6,000 people that pray with us all over the world. We're in over 80 countries. And, and people from all over the place join us to pray online which has led us to doing the traveling that we do. I'll talk more about that later, but I wanted just to share that with you because you might have thought it was strange that we have this camera and I'm talking to it. They're, they're gone now. They're probably joining us up here now. Um, but that's led us here to be with you folks tonight, and I'm so thankful to Nick for um, graciously allowing us to come and spend an evening with you. We're going to be talking about revival tonight. We're going to be praising and worshiping God and letting the Holy Spirit just lead us. And if you want to pray the rosary with us, by the way, you can go to, we have a special YouTube channel just for that. It's called Rosary Crew with Keith Nestor. We normally do that every day at 5 p.m. Central, so 6 p.m. Eastern, your time. The weekends, it's earlier in the day. But once it's prayed live, it's still there. So you can always jump on there and pray that with us. And we have an incredible community of people that are a part of that. So thank you guys for um, spending this time tonight with us. And with that, let's pray together, and then we're going to have some worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we come into this place tonight thanking you, giving you glory, and, and rejoicing that you've called us together 
to be the body of Christ. You have given yourself to us. And we ask that the Holy Spirit would come and fill this room with your power. That whatever happens tonight would be the will of God. That it wouldn't be about us. It wouldn't be about something that we do just because we want to have something fun. But Lord, it would be completely devoted to you. So let your spirit fall upon us as we offer our hearts and our voices and every part of us to you, Lord. You said the most important thing we could ever do is love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. God, let that be true for us tonight. We give you thanks. We come before you, Lord, asking that your will be done in our lives. We pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You might look around at this space if this is all new to you, Awakened Catholic, and think, wow, so much technology and like stuff that normally isn't in a Catholic thing. Wow, they're going to have lyrics up for us on the screens. We're not. But we're going to praise tonight. We're going to worship tonight with uh, some songs that are theoretically more likely to be familiar to you. And if you're not familiar with them, that's okay. Just kind of hum along or make up some gibberish because hopefully that your neighbor is worshiping so hardcore that no one can hear you anyway. If you do know the words and you're not singing along, God sees you. If I can get someone real strong to <laughs> clamp this up stronger than me, this is not staying. Thank you, Keith. It's also awkward because I'm holding a guitar. I'm actually super strong, just beautiful. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. All right, but what if it didn't feel like that? Let's all stand up. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, your rich in love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i'll worship your holy name and on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Let's just really, before we move on, let's just really 
sit in those words. The words of that verse, they're kind of, you know, it's an upbeat song, it's a happy feeling song, but it's kind of weird when we really think about what we're singing. We're talking about the moment we die, um, which most of us day to day, we kind of operate like we're not going to eventually. <laughs> um, on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. It's terrifying to imagine our strength failing. You know, like we get these little glimmers of our mortality. The older you get, the more you know what I'm talking about. You know, like, oh, your back hurts more than it used to. I have an arm that's worthless now. Like these things happen. And the reality is that we are going to die. And uh, that's it. Have a good night, everyone. But the Christian, the Christian life is one of hope and, and joy in the resurrection. Amen. We're an Easter people. We're not like just an Ash Wednesday people. Right? Because remember you are dust and unto dust you shall return is not the end of the story. The book end of that is the resurrection. You will return to ash and then you will rise on the last day. As our blessed Lord tells us in the Gospel of John chapter 6. So I just want to invite you to, to, if you are familiar with these words, to sing these words again, really reflecting on what you're saying. Really reflecting on what you're singing. And if you don't know the words, it's okay. Just like sit in it, hear it, listen to it, pray it. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore, forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name, I worship Your holy name. Jesus, I'll worship your holy name. Amen. spoke a word you were singing over me that's right sing it out you have been so so good to me before i took a breath you breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't turn it. I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yeah. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights 
still I'm found leaves the 99. I couldn't turn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yeah. There's no shadow you won't light up. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. There's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Man, that's another set of words that's, that's pretty tricky for me. It's like a lot of us have sung this song a bunch of times. A lot of us have heard this song a bunch of times. And maybe we're like, yeah, there's no shadow. You, can, you won't light up. Yeah, there's no mountain. You won't climb up. You know, ain't no mountain high, ain't no valley low. I don't know how to play on guitar. That'd be fun, though. But the point is that like we, we can say these things and we kind of get desensitized to saying these things. And then it's like, yeah, obviously, except for that shadow or obviously, except for that mountain or that wall. That wall he won't kick down because that's like stuck with me. That's just part of who I am. That's part of my identity. And we don't even realize we're doing that. Amen. Like that's just, it's something we find ourselves doing. Like, oh, I'm this kind of Catholic or, oh, I'm this kind of Christian. Oh, I don't worship. Thank you, Nick, though. We just kind of like put ourselves into these gutters, these ruts. And we think, yeah, yeah God loves me here. This is where God's brought me. This is where I'm going to be. You know, I go to Mass make donations to the Rosary Crew and Awaken Catholic. So I'm like super holy. That's all it takes. But like God is never finished with us. God is never finished with us. And I just want to invite you right now to contemplate like what are the shadows in my heart, in my mind, in my life that I haven't even realized I haven't let God into, let him shed his light into it. What are the walls that I've built around my heart? Or what are the parts of your heart that you've built walls up around? Without meaning to. I just want to invite you to sing these words with me again. There's no shadow you won't light up. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. One more time. No shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, 
Till you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Go ahead and have a seat, everyone. Whew. Oh, man. Amen. I love me some worship. Especially, you guys know that song that's like, Lord, I lift your name on high. You know, I think it's it's very bothersome to me as an OCD person. Can I borrow that hand? It's very bothersome to me as an OCD person to like ever sing that song because nobody has their hands lifted high when they're singing that song. It's like, what are we doing here? What are we doing? Why? Change the name or ch change the words to like, Lord, I stand in this pew and sing like everyone else without moving my arms at all. But to me, what's powerful is like when we can sing a song and it's not just about motions, you know, that's fun in high school and stuff. But like, like when I'm praying these words and I'm singing, I'm like making a sacrifice of these words. I'm making an offering of these words to Christ, you know, that I'm entrusting myself to him, right? Like I'm entrusting those shadowy parts of my heart. I'm entrusting the barriers that I've built around myself. I'm entrusting that to him. I'm making an offering to him of myself. And I seek when I'm doing that to do that more completely. And so the question should be asked, like, why though? Like, why are we doing that? What, what's the point? What, what does it mean to entrust yourself completely to God? What does it mean to give him those shadowy, dark parts of your heart? What do these words mean? And I'm, I'm really, really excited tonight uh, to have as a guest here at Awaken Catholic, my, my dear friend, Keith Nestor, uh, and, and to talk about this notion of revival. And I want to share with you what that's meant for me. Uh, very briefly, to then hear the really good stuff. For me, I, I was brought up at a Catholic school in a Catholic family, but I had no idea what I had. I had no idea the gift that I had been given. And that's, I don't want to say that that's my parents' fault. I don't want to say that that's my Catholic school teacher's fault. It's whoever's fault it was, and that's irrelevant. The point is I had no idea what I, what I had, this gift. Yet, part of that gift was this incredibly immense and epic thing, right? So the, the Catholic Church proposes that when we receive the holy sacraments, that we're actually receiving grace, like these little tastes of divinity, the, the, this encounter with the divine. And like that's not something to scoff at when you consider what, what the ramifications of that are. But I just went about my, my childhood just, you know, doing the little communion waddle along with everyone else, you know. Oh, finally, now it's now Mass is, like, about to be done. Dad, can we leave? No, we got to wait for the final blessing. Why? Because we're supposed to. And then, like, it doesn't mean anything to me in those days, right? But this incredible thing is happening, you know. Think of, think of a king that disguises himself. Or maybe very practically. Who here has seen the original, the only worthy Aladdin movie? The cartoon. Okay. Princess Jasmine, she disguises herself as a normal person. She goes into the town. She's hanging out. Nobody recognizes her, but this royalty is with them, right? The guards are even, like, about to arrest her and arrest Aladdin, and then she's like, wait, 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 it's me. And they're like, oh, my gosh, Princess Jasmine. And I think that that's what's happening with us. Like, God comes down to us in disguise, right, in the Eucharist, in the sacraments, and we don't even realize what we're engaging with, and that was me. So all of these years, I'm receiving the sacraments, I'm receiving this profound gift, and I'm oblivious to it, but it was still in me, but it was like hidden in me. And years later, after so many painful, disgusting, stupid mistakes in my life, and when I say painful, it's like, yeah, it's painful to me in those moments, it's painful to the people I'm hurting in those moments, I was tremendously selfish. It was awful. It was no bueno. You wouldn't have wanted to be one of my friends. And after all of that, when I finally came back to God, and I'm not going to give you the full witness right now. It's available online, and we can talk later if you want. But, but when I came to God, and I came rushing 
reaching out for the love and the mercy of God in Jesus Christ in the Catholic Church, the power of the sacraments, when I came back to that, I just realized I needed saving. I needed saving because I wasn't going to be able to figure it out myself. I wasn't going to be able to save myself. Lord knows I tried so many times, and it was always a train wreck. It was always a disaster. It always meant hurting myself more, hurting others more. Right? That's what we do when we're sinning. We're, we're trying to provide for ourselves. We're trying to provide for our needs. We're trying to save ourselves because we don't trust that God has our best interest at heart. We don't trust that he'll really take care of my desire for satisfaction. And so when I gave up on trying to save myself and I turned to the only true Savior, everything changed. And so when I sing words like, Lord, I want to give you everything that I am. And if there's any part of my heart that I haven't given you yet, I want to give it to you because you're going to be a way better God with that part of my heart than I can possibly be. So when, we, when I'm singing these words, all of that history and all of that reality I'm, I'm offering it back to God because even when, we, even when we do come to faith, even when we do come to Christ, come to Holy Mother Church, it's still a progression. We're still slowly realizing the parts that we need to let go of, the parts that we need to bring to him. And I want to invite you, if, if you are hungry for a deepened revival, seek out, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, seek out the parts of yourself that you are still clinging on to, that you don't even realize you are trying to be your own savior. Amen? So before I pass it back to Keith, I'm going to sing you one more song. And this is not like communal. It's just me. If you know the song, don't sing it. Just, just enjoy it. This is a song that uh, means a lot to me. Um, after years and years of, of providing this song at events, um, I finally have gotten to a point where like most of the time I can perform it without crying, but no guarantees. <laughs> this is a song, it's called You Found Me. I wish I could take credit for writing it because uh, it's amazing. But for the purposes of tonight, can we just pretend like I wrote this? It's actually written by a really amazing uh, duo. It's called Loud Harp. I have been wandering for years, looking for but not finding a safe place to lay my head. I have been stumbling in darkness, searching for a real love. Ooh. Ooh. You found me and you pulled me out. You found me and you pulled me out. You found me and you brought me home. You found me and you pulled me out. You found me and you pulled me out. You found me and you brought me home. You have eyes to see what I've hidden in my shame 
neck deep in the mire. Won't you pull me out? Wrap me in your arms. You found me and you pulled me out. You found me and you pulled me out. You found me and you brought me home. You found me and you pulled me out. You found me and you pulled me out. You found me and you brought me home. You're a good father. This is a good home. Right in the palm of your hands, you're not letting go. You're a good father. This is a good home. Right in the palm of your hands, you're not letting go. You found me and you pulled me out. You found me and you pulled me out. You found me and you brought me home. You found me and you pulled me out. You found me and you pulled me out. You found me and you brought me Regardless of where you've been, regardless of the muck that you've found yourself in before or that you're in currently, it's like Peter walking on water and he falls because he takes his eyes off of God. And Jesus doesn't just immediately save him. He reaches down, extends his arm, but he waits for Peter to see it and grab onto it. And all we have to do is reach back up because no matter what muck we find ourselves in, we just have to reach up and let him pull us up. And with that, I want to invite up my brother, Keith Nestor. Thank you, sir. Wow. I got to admit, like, so I don't know if you know my background, but I used to be a, a youth pastor. I was a Protestant pastor for 22 years, and we did a lot of this type of stuff. <laughs> Stell and I were walking around here. I'm like, doesn't this feel like we're back at youth group again? Uh, doesn't this feel like, you know, our past and things? And, and uh, that first song that we sang tonight, 10,000 Reasons, that was, that's one of my favorite uh, praise and worship songs of all time. And I don't get to sing it that much anymore because I'm a Latin mass going Catholic now. So I wonder what that would sound like in Latin. Can we do that, Nick? You have that? Um, but I'm, I'm so thankful to be here. We talked tonight about, when Nick and I were, were kicking around this idea of coming here, around this idea of revival. Now, we all are probably familiar with this because we're in this thing called a Eucharistic revival right now. Have you heard that? Okay. What does it mean? Do we have any framework for what that means? I want to talk about that tonight because revival is one of those words that I think can mean different things to different people. And I want to explore what that looks like in the context of the Eucharist. But before we get that far, we have to acknowledge something very important when it comes to an understanding of revival. For a revival to take place, because we, we've kind of seen some different things. I don't know if you guys paid attention to what happened last year in the news when they had that, that revival down in, in uh, Asbury, which is a, a college which is um, affiliated with the denomination I used to be a part of as a Methodist, okay? Um, and if I don't know if you saw what happened down there, but a bunch of students got together during chapel, and they just, after the chapel service was technically over, they just decided to stay and keep worshiping God. And after a couple hours, somebody sent an email out to the student body and just invited people to come. And, and then all these people started showing up to the chapel, 
And they just kept singing and worshiping God. And the next thing I knew, it was on the news, and people are traveling down there, and they announced, this is a revival. And people kind of reacted in different ways to that. Some people thought, this is it. We've, all, we've studied these things in history. We've seen the Great Awakening. We've seen these different, these different things, typically affiliated with like our Protestant brothers and sisters having these incredible revival movements. And I don't know yet as Catholics how we relate to that. And, and then it seemed like in an instant it was, go, it was over, wasn't it? They just stopped talking about it. Everybody went home after a couple of weeks, and that was the end of it. Now, I'm not here to say whether or not that was an actual revival because I don't think you can know those things based on what you see on the news. You know when a revival has happened when something has been revived. Now, in order for something to be revived, it has to have already existed. Otherwise, it would just be a revival. Have you ever heard that word before? I never have. I just made it up. But a revival means something has been revived. And when we're looking at this idea of a Eucharistic revival, we have to recognize that we have to start somewhere. And where we have to start is the place where we understand what is going on with the Eucharist. What is going on with our relationship to it. Now for me as a, as a non-Catholic, I didn't understand the Eucharist. And it wasn't until I had met someone who was a Catholic and he started to challenge me as I was challenging him on why he was Catholic. He started challenging me on why I wasn't. And the first place that he went to in the Bible was where I want to take us tonight. And it's in John chapter 6. It's kind of a familiar passage that I know a lot of you are going to go, yeah, we've studied this a million times. But I want to look at it in a little bit different way because I think it, it only works when you realize what was happening before Jesus said these words. And of course, the words I'm talking about is, is when Jesus says, very truly I tell you, this is John 6 verse 32, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen, and still you do not believe. Now, friends, we, we've talked about this a little bit farther down there. The Jews are grumbling, and they said, how can he say this, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then he says in verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Now, of course, you guys know there's more to it than that. And the idea being that our, our life doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from God and it is found in the Eucharist. So a Eucharistic revival doesn't start with us deciding we're going to have a revival. We, we can't engineer that. We can't say, all right, the Eucharistic revival is going to start on this day at this time in this place. We can put ourselves in that position, but a revival is a move of God. It's something that God does that stirs up within us this passion that we have to have life. But where does it come from? Remember, all of these people that Jesus was talking to are there for one reason. Because he fed them. He fed them physically. This happens right after the feeding of the 5,000 men, which they had been with him. They'd seen his miracles. 
They had listened to his teaching. They had heard the things that he said. And, and then because they had been with him for so long, Jesus took compassion upon them and he fed them, not just spiritually, but then he fed them physically. In a miraculous way, he fed them. He took five loaves and two fishes and he multiplied the loaves and the fishes and, and thousands were fed. And, and this is where we have to begin our understanding of revival. Because we have to understand that God desires to feed our hearts and our, our, our physical bodies as well. He wants all of us, my friends. So as we come to him, we have to remember that we're there because of his grace. So I'm asking you, have you received that grace? Is there something within you that even can be revived? You see, you can't have a revival if you haven't first started with the true faith. But what does it mean to have a revival in the Eucharist? Why does the church give this to us? Where does this come from and what is the point of all of it? I believe we'll see three, three things happen in a Eucharistic revival. And they're going to be things that happen both to us as individuals and they're going to be things that happen to us corporately as a church. And the first one I think is this. When we recognize the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist, that belief is what needs to be revived first and foremost, isn't it? Because we've all seen the statistics. They're not good, are they? How many Catholics don't believe in the real presence of Jesus? It's like 70-some percent. People come into Mass and, and, and not even understanding or believing in the reality of the Eucharist. And I'm here to tell you this. If the Eucharist isn't real, there's really no reason for us to be Catholic. There's really no reason. I know that it might feel good and you might have some friends there and all of that kind of stuff. But if the Eucharist isn't true, then you might as well stay home. So the first part of revival has to begin with our awakening and a revival in our spirit of the reality of the body and blood of Christ present with us in the Eucharist. Those words from John 6 that we read first. Jesus says, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Do you believe that? Friends, many people didn't believe it even when Jesus himself said it, did they? This is when a lot of the people that had followed him, that had received miracles, that had declared their allegiance to him, turned around and walked away and they said this. And guess what? You've heard people say this today too, haven't you? This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? We probably all know people, maybe we're some of them, that we, we love Catholicism, but there's parts of what the church teaches that we go, that's a hard teaching. Who can accept that? I mean, I want to be Catholic, but do I really have to go to Mass every Sunday? That's a hard teaching. Who can accept it? I, I, I love being Catholic. It's awesome. But, you know, contraception is okay, right? I know the church says we shouldn't do that, but this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And, and you can insert all kinds of things. Maybe it's a theological thing that you're struggling with, that you're wrestling with. And, and we want to play this game where we can pick and choose the parts of our faith that we like, that fit into our lives. And then we want to leave the other things behind. Friends, Jesus leaves no room for that, does he? He didn't leave any room for that with these Jews. Because for them, the idea that they could eat his flesh and drink his blood was an incredibly hard teaching because their law forbid them from eating blood. They weren't allowed to do that. So for them, this idea, and they couldn't even touch a dead body. To touch a dead body would make you instantly unclean. So what Jesus is asking them to do, it sounds so scandalous. It sounds so difficult. It sounds so ungodly that even though they'd seen miracles, even though they'd heard the words of, of Christ, when he revealed this truth to them, I said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? So I want to begin tonight with asking you, is there a hard teaching that you're struggling to accept? If anything comes out of the Eucharistic revival, make it be your belief in the Eucharist. And once you have that belief, then I believe with all my heart that everything else will fall into place. When I was struggling with becoming Catholic, there's a lot of things you have to believe to become Catholic. You guys probably already knew that. 
But I remember like talking to a priest going, I really have to believe this. I have to believe Mary never sinned. I have to believe she was a perpetual virgin. I have to believe all this other stuff. Like, that's a lot of stuff. I don't know if I even know it all. How can I believe all of that? And I remember my priest said to me, really, you just need to believe two things right now. You need to believe that the Pope is the successor to St. Peter, and he is your ultimate authority on what Christianity is. And you need to believe that Jesus Christ is truly present in the Eucharist. If you can believe those two things, the rest will fall in line. We make it so complicated, though, don't we? We're like, well, what did Thomas Aquinas say on, you know, Tuesday afternoon at 3 o'clock? What, what, what did this particular council say after everybody went home, you know, and the guys came back? I don't know. Like, sometimes we get so intricate and so dug in to these theological nuances and, and, and we get into the weeds. And I think sometimes we do that because we don't want to do the hard stuff that is a difficult teaching. Who can accept it? If I can somehow sort of convince myself that has grasped all of these difficult theological concepts and understand the third secret of Fatima, then I don't really have to be nice to that guy who gets on my nerves. I've skipped that part. If I can, if I can go to Eucharistic adoration five hours a week and, and, and pray all the mysteries of the rosary and do all these things, then do I really need to sacrifice my finances and give to the, to the needs of the church? a hard teaching who can accept it you know what we wind up doing my friends we wind up gravitating toward the things that come natural to us and then camping out in those areas and then saying that because i'm really good in this particular area i don't have to do that other thing over there it happens to all of us but jesus leaves no room for that my friends and if you truly believe that he's present in the Eucharist, then those other things will all start to flow together. Because when you recognize that he's there for you, you won't want to hold anything back from him. So the first aspect of a Eucharistic revival has to begin with the revival of the belief that he's really there. Because that belief is going to lead to every other thing that you need to do and know and think and receive. But you'll never get there if you don't start with the hard truth that his flesh is true food and his blood is true drink. If you don't start with that, you can't move on. It's like math. It's like math. If you skip the first two days of whatever unit you're in in math and then you start paying attention on Thursday and the quiz is Friday, you're not going to be able to do anything, are you? It, it's progressive. It, 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 it goes linearly. That's how our faith is. we got to start with with the truths that are given to us, and then they build from there. You can't skip over things. What will that look like in your life, individually, if you have that Eucharistic revival in your heart, and you, you revive that belief in the true presence of Jesus? What would that look like for you? You know, the truth is, I can't answer that for you. I'm still trying to figure out what it looks like for me. But I know this. When, when I am truly living in that place in my heart where I recognize that that's truly him, here's the thing. When I go to Mass, I, I'm not daydreaming about what I'm doing the rest of the day. I'm not sitting there going, boy, I sure wish Father would wrap this up. I'm not even that worked up if the music is a little off-key. I'm not even worked up if, if somebody next to me does something they're not supposed to do during the Mass, and I, I judge them. Or, or what are all of the things that get in the way? When I'm there, I'm focused so much like a laser beam on, on Jesus in the Eucharist, and when it comes time for me to go forward to receive Him, I, I, I go forward with, with love and, and, and reverence in my heart. Friends, when I'm face-to-face -face with that, I, I don't want to leave. I'm right there. What does that look like for you? When you go to Mass, are you truly present? Because we know that He is, but are we? You can be sitting there physically, but be off in la-la land somewhere. You know, Jesus talked about that, didn't He? He said, your hearts, your lips are right in the right spot, but your hearts are far from me. We've got to be all about it, friends. Part one of a Eucharistic revival is recognizing that he's truly present and then making ourselves truly present. That's important.
But what does that look like on a corporate level, right? What does it look like in the church? Now, you and I have no, like, authority in the church. I can't walk into a Catholic church and say, all right, here's what I've decided. But I can tell you this. Sometimes, and maybe this isn't the way it's supposed to be. I used to be a pastor, so I can say this with some experience, okay? Sometimes the tail wags the dog a little bit. And here's what I mean by that. Your priest is working really, really hard to take care of your soul. And there are things that you do that gets on his nerves. And the, the, the thing that probably gets on his nerves more than anything else is that you don't take seriously what he's trying to do to help you grow in your faith. And he can see it in your face. And, and he's reluctant, probably, to, to push you in certain ways that he knows you're going to complain about. But if you are the ones going to him, crying out to him, saying, Father, we are hungry for the Eucharist. We are hungry for more. We want to be there. And, and you're showing up to everything he's trying to do. And when he opens up hours for confession, you're there waiting for him. When he says, hey, have you guys ever wanted to do some Eucharistic adoration? You're there waiting. You're asking for more. You're saying, Father, what can I do to get involved? What can I do to help? What do you need, Father? When you're excited and enthusiastic about your faith, if all of us are like that, that's going to wag the dog a little bit. Sometimes our priests, we, we give them a hard time, don't we? And we're like, why are they just mailing it in? Well, the reality is they're human beings like the rest of us. And I can tell you from experience, when I used to stand in front of teenagers every single week, it was really hard to do the whole, you know, have energy and be be engaging and all that stuff when they were sitting there with their with, with their thumbs up their nose and and they looked like they didn't want to be there and they, it was the last thing that they wanted to do and they were forced you know, did that make me want to like really work hard and try hard now I should anyway but the reality is it made it a lot tougher but when I had a few students that were like Keith we, we want to learn more about this show us in the Bible where this is coming from or, or what can we do or this and that that like influenced me as their leader. And, and our priests are no different, my friends. When we show them that we're hungry for what they are wanting to serve us, they're going to want to serve more. It's like when you have somebody over to your house for dinner. If somebody came over to your house for dinner and, and, and you made them spaghetti and meatballs and they devoured every morsel and asked for seconds, right? That's exciting for you. And when they say, man, I would love to come back for more, you're excited when you know they're coming back to make more. But if when they showed up, you fed them and they were just kind of like, oh, I'm not really into that. Or I'll just take a little bit. Or, you know, it's just not my thing. You know how that is. Friends, the Eucharistic revival begins in our hearts and it works through us. But it's also a blessing to our priests as well. So we're going to have those that reverence and we're going to recognize what it means for us to be truly present like he's truly present. Friends, additionally, when there's a Eucharistic revival, we are going to see fruit. In John chapter 15, this is so important. In John chapter 15, Jesus is talking about what it means that he abides in us and we abide in him. He uses that language in John 6 too. He says, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, I will abide. You'll have life and I'll abide in you. And in John 15, he's using the imagery of a vine and a branch. And he says, whoever abides in me will bear fruit, fruit that will last. The fruit of a Eucharistic revival isn't a flash in the pan, my friends. It isn't something that happens for a few days or a couple of weeks, and then everybody forgets about it and goes back to normal. If you think that that's what's supposed to happen with a Eucharistic revival, it's, it's an event where everybody goes to and gets all excited for a little bit, and then everybody goes back to their regular lives, and Things are just kind of the way they were, but we had a great experience. You haven't experienced a revival. You just did something fun. And it might have been fun. That's fine. But a revival isn't meant to die out. It's meant to set you on fire. And the Bible tells us that our God is a consuming fire. And when Christ comes to dwell in us, and we receive that, that fruit, that fruit that comes from that abiding with Christ and Him in us, and there's no greater picture of that than receiving the Eucharist, my friends. That's how He comes to remain in us and we remain in Him. 
He says, you will bear fruit. Fruit that will last. What does that look like to you? What is the fruit? What does it mean? It means lasting change. Lasting change. Think about that. Where do you need to change? Are you trying to do it yourself? Friends, I want to encourage you to don't try to feed yourself. Let the Lord feed you. And remember, when you abide in Him, He abides in you. What does that look like in your life? You know, I can't tell you that either. But I can tell you this, in my life, since I've been Catholic, I've seen a lot of change. I've seen things in my life completely change. I've seen things that I would never have thought were were remotely interesting become the center of my life, like the rosary, for example. Even when I first became Catholic, that was the last thing I thought I would ever do. The rosary. Isn't that for just like old ladies, you know, sitting in church? And now I can't go a day without praying the rosary at least once. It's, it's not just something that I fit into my life. It is my life, my friends. And, and I have no explanation for that. I, I love what we did here tonight, this contemporary worship. I used to be a worship leader. I used to be a worship director. I, I used to train worship leaders. That was a huge part of my ministry. Wrote worship songs, recorded music, all that kind of stuff. Like, this was my jam. I hated liturgical worship. I thought it was so boring and dry and dull and lifeless. I thought, where's the Holy Spirit in that? And don't get me wrong, I still love some contemporary worship like we had tonight. But when, when I go to the Mass and, and participate in the sacred liturgy and the readings and the prayers and, and the, the, the Roman rite, all of that, and obviously the, the, the consecrated Eucharist, it fills my heart with a joy that I've never experienced before, a depth of worship, and I finally go, wow, I am part of God's one true church, and I'm worshiping with all the angels and saints, and we're all in unison. I'm not just in my own little world over here trying to conjure up some kind of feeling. I'm a part of something, and, and I can't even believe how much I love that. It blows me away. I've got a long way to go, my friends, a long way to go. But when you let Christ abide in you, lasting change will take place. So what is it going to mean for us to have a Eucharistic revival? I don't know ultimately, but here's the thing. It's going to be amazing. And it's going to be something that will connect you to Christ in a way that he's been waiting to do in your life for a long time. And it begins with reviving your belief in him with your belief in Him. See, in the Catholic faith, it's not just one of those things where it doesn't matter what you believe. It just matters that you're around. You can say, well, I don't know. You're Jesus this, my Jesus that. You guys do it your way. We do it our way. No, friends, that's not how truth is. There's one truth. There's one faith. There's one Lord. There's one baptism. And there's one body of Christ, my friends. And we're called to embrace that truth So may our Eucharistic revival begin with the revival in our hearts and the revival of recognizing that He's truly present. And because we recognize that, we can be truly present too. Friends, let's stand together and let's pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, we are hungry for you. we've, We've come tonight, Lord, and you have called us to worship you and to hear your words and to be revived in our belief of you. And Lord, I pray tonight that that would be the fruit of this night. That if there be any teaching that we consider too hard, that we can't accept, that we would repent of that right now. That we would turn and follow you, that we would lay everything on the line for the truth that you are the living bread which has come down from heaven that whoever eats of this bread will live. Lord, we want to live. Make it so in our hearts. We pray these things in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. I loved Keith's message about <clears throat> challenging us. As Christ makes himself fully present to us in the Mass, are we making ourselves fully present to him in the Mass? Sing that again. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Just like with any relationship, we get what we put into it. So with God, He offers Himself completely to us, but a lot of times it doesn't feel like it because we just simply aren't doing the same. The words here are, you won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. Sing that with me. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. You won't relent. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart. Lord, we don't want just a flash in the pan moment. We don't want just a feeling. We want everything that you are. We offer you everything that we are, Lord. Help us. Give us the grace. Give us the courage to offer you more than we thought we could of ourselves. Just everything. Help us not to hold anything back from you, Lord. That the change that we experience in our lives would be true and permanent, would be real. That we would die to ourselves to live in you. 
that we would fall more deeply in love with you in the Holy Eucharist, that our love and passion for you in response to your love and passion for us would be a sign to the world of your love, would be a sign to the world of the truth of who you are. Help us to be beautiful, powerful emissaries of your gospel, of your holy church. Mother Mary, we ask for your intercession. We ask you to be with us as we journey, be with us, usher us closer to your, your son. We pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, uh, man, thank you so much to those of you who came uh, in person tonight. Uh, such a cool group to have here this evening. Please do stick around. Uh, talk to Keith and I if you want to pray with us. We're, we're happy to do that. I uh, would love to get to know you. Um, and just so you know, Keith, what is the website again where if people want to help you on this voyage of, of the Rosary Crew and all the things you're doing, where can they do that? Down to Earth Ministry. Dot org. Uh, we'll have a link in the description. And then if you want to support the work of Awakened Catholic, visit awakencatholic.org slash donate. Um, and guys, just uh, just stay connected to us. We have a lot of cool things going on, both Down to Earth Ministries and Awakened Catholic. Uh, here in Awakened Catholic next month on uh, May 8th or 9th, I think it's the 9th, whatever that Thursday is, uh, we have a really cool event coming up where we're going to be. We're going to have uh, Peter Range, who is the CEO of Ohio Right to Life, and he is going to be speaking on this upcoming election and uh, sort of presenting a Catholic uh, social teachings on different topics that will help us make a formed decision. And so that'll be right here at Awaken Theater. And then on June first, uh, we're going to have a Spanish Eucharistic revival with a good friend of mine, Hector Molina, and we're really excited about that. Um, and so just stay connected to us. Make sure you're on the newsletter on our website. Make sure you're following the Rosary Crew and Down to Earth Ministries. Um, and yeah, make sure if you're here in person to stick around. Uh, and if you're online, please share the link to this live stream um, and all of the good things. Keith, thank you so much for being here today. And your beautiful wife, Estelle, thank you. And thank you all and have a great night. God bless. I should have mentioned also, Keith has two awesome books that are available over at the bar. Uh, so not only by buying one of his books do you support the work he's doing, but you also get blessed by the contents of said books. Uh, and then my book on the Eucharist is also over there. Alina and I have some CDs over there that are just free will offering. We're trying to get rid of them. So if you just like drop a handful of good wishes and pr you know promises for prayers, grab CDs, uh, whatever you want to do. All right, God bless you guys.